welcome to my presentation on Life as an Okie, Surviving the Dust Bowl. Today we're going to discuss what led to the Dust Bowl, what it looked like, the lives it impacted, how it affected the economy, and how it intersected with my own family tree and my grandparents as they sought to survive. And most importantly, we'll discuss the resiliency of the American people and how they recovered from this terrible tragedy. The Dust Bowl was actually a series of droughts, one after another, that plagued the Great Plains of the Midwest for over a decade. Each drought led straight into another, with no time for people, the land, or the economy to recover. Dust literally covered every surface inside and outside. At times, there was zero visibility, and many, many people suffered. One particular storm paints a vivid picture of what it was like to endure the Dust Bowl. On April 14, 1935, over 3 million tons of topsoil entered the atmosphere. It covered multiple states, created zero visibility, and was thereafter referred to as Black Sunday. In her book, Letters from the Dust Bowl, Caroline Henderson described the conditions in this way. Dust to eat, and dust to breathe, and dust to drink. Dust in the beds and in the flower bin, on dishes and walls and windows, and hair and eyes and ears and teeth and throats, to say nothing of the heaped up accumulation on floors and windowsills after one of the bad days. These dust storms became a way of life for people across over 100 million acres of land in the Great Plains, stretching across the states of Oklahoma, Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, and Nebraska. The economies of these states were devastated by the storms, and more than 10,000 family farms were destroyed during the droughts. This was particularly brutal for homestead farmers, who simply farmed enough to feed themselves, their families, and local residents. They simply had no means of recovery, no means of providing for themselves. Unfortunately, the Dust Bowl coincided with another nationwide tragedy, the Great Depression, which was considered one of the worst economic downturns in the history of the industrialized world, meaning there was no help coming to those that lived in the Great Plains, for everyone was suffering, and there was little prosperity. Left with few options, most people in these states had to migrate elsewhere just to survive. During that period between 1930 and 1939, more than 3 million Americans were forced to migrate to other regions. It is considered the largest migration in U.S. history. Multi-generational families had to seek their fortunes elsewhere. But conditions were rough. Most of them were raised simply to farm. They had limited education and limited expertise outside of their homestead farming capabilities. This is what led to the California Connection. With its rich agricultural industry, many migrants, most of whom were farmers, saw it as an opportunity to apply their skills and trades on massive farms that were in need of cheap labor. In addition to agriculture, California was seen as a highly industrialized state, with businesses popping up all over, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, San Diego, Sacramento. These businesses too required cheap labor and there were more than enough willing participants entering the state from the Great Plains. So how did this happen? How did such a massive portion of the United States find itself completely unprepared for this massive drought? What were the conditions that led up to the drought? And how much of this was to blame on the government and poor planning? First, there was the idea of manifest destiny. A phrase first coined in 1845, it denoted the idea of the United States being destined to expand its dominion and spread democracy and capitalism across the North American continent. It was manifest destiny that led to the creation of the Transcontinental Railroad. Linking east to west, this massive railroad 
built over the course of seven years would connect the nation in a way it never had been, providing an easy way to transport necessary resources and equipment to farm and develop lands that were otherwise unreachable. In the year 1869, the Homestead Act encouraged citizens to move west, providing them with land and resources to open their own farms, to provide for themselves and to establish small cities in what was once a desolate Great Plain. In the late 19th, early 20th century, there had been an uncommon level of rainfall in the Great Plains. This had many, led many to believe that it was fertile land, that it would be farmed easily, and that it would be sustainable over a long period of time. They were sadly mistaken. Settlers had failed to realize that they were actually building their farms in a desert, and they employed farming strategies that could not be sustained once the water stopped and the dry season began. Overcultivation and deep plowing in the decades preceding the droughts had led to a weak topsoil, married with a high grain demand in the 1920s leading up to the Great Depression. You simply found that the land had been overworked and was underprepared for the drier conditions that were coming. When the rain stopped, there were no trees, no grass, nothing to block the topsoil from taking flight, creating a storm of clouds of dust that would plague the Midwest for the coming decade. The effects of this drought and these dust storms would be felt all across the nation and in some cases across the globe. The red misty dust would reach all the way to the east and west coasts, in some cases even creating red snow on the east coast. Recently, dust particles were discovered in Greenland that could be traced back to these storms in the Midwest. For those living in the middle of the dust storms, the effects were brutal. Schools closed. A new disease developed called dust pneumonia. Infant and elderly mortality increased, as well as poverty. Over $25 million a day were lost due to the crop failures and Oklahoma was hit the hardest, with more than 400,000 of its citizens forced to relocate. Migrants that were leaving Oklahoma became known as Okies. This was meant to be a derogatory term to describe the lower class, economically disadvantaged, lower education individuals that were leaving Oklahoma and heading out to other states. Eventually, Term Oki was used to describe anybody from the Great Plains who was migrating elsewhere. In the midst of all this uncertainty, two young teenagers, Arlen Thoreau Martin and Estelle Orander, decided to get married. With very few prospects there in Oklahoma, no jobs to be found, and hardly a penny to their names, they decided to join some of their comrades and head west towards California and hopefully towards a brighter future. Eventually arriving in Richmond, California, Arlen set about his plan to provide a brighter future for himself and his new bride. His future didn't go quite as planned, and he spent many of those first days, weeks, and months scraping together a living as a handyman, even going door to door, asking for work, trying to make ends meet. After several months, Harlan was able to get his dream job working at Ford Motor Company as an entry-level linesman, working in the assembly plants, building cars that he himself could not afford to drive. But his future looked a little bit brighter, and California, it seemed, had been the right call after all. Harlan and Stella spent the next several years establishing their new life in California having several children and making many trips back and forth between their new home in California and their friends and family in Oklahoma. Through all of this, he never failed to send what little money he could home to his family who he loved and missed. After 10 years in California, 
Arlen and Stella, along with their new kids, decided that it was time to go back to Oklahoma. And for the next several years, Arlen split his time between California and Ford Motor Company and Oklahoma in working coal mines on the eastern part of the state. Eventually, Arlen retired from Ford Motor Company and moved back to Oklahoma full time along with his wife and six kids. Not long after that, the grandkids started coming and then the grand great grandkids and even the great great grandkids. Today, you would find most of the Martin clan still living in the western tip of Oklahoma with just a few of us scattered here in California. Even decades after the end of the Dust Bowl, Arlen could still recall the red cloudy skies, the landscapes covered in dirt, even the smells. He could also recall the disappointment that he felt when he had to leave and move to California. But more importantly, the excitement when much, much later he was able to return and finish his life in Oklahoma, the land that he loved. Given the many challenges that were facing the United States during that time, there wasn't a lot that the government could do to quickly remedy the situation. But steps were taken over a fairly short period of time to try to not only correct the situation, but make improvements that would last many generations to come. More than anything, the Americans affected by the Dust Bowl needed encouragement. And they didn't need to look any further than their president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who in one of his many famous fireside chats took time to discuss his own findings when visiting those areas affected by the drought. In this speech, he said, no cracked earth, no blistering sun, no burning wind, no grasshoppers are a permanent match for the indomitable American farmers and stockmen and their wives and children who have carried on through desperate days and inspired us with their self-reliance, their tenacity, and their courage. It was their father's task to make homes. It is their task to keep those homes. And it is our task to help them with the fight. FDR worked with Congress to bring about programs like the Federal Drought Relief Act, established in 1933. They also created the Prairie State Forest Program in an effort to plant wind-breaking trees that would help with future winds and future droughts. These were just a few of the steps taken to reassure those that were affected that their government was behind them and that there was hope. In addition to the economic and social impact of the drought, there was also a cultural impact. And this era produced some of the greatest authors, photographers, and musicians of the 20th century. Perhaps the greatest fictional account of life lived in the Dust Bowl would be John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. Houses were shut tight and cloth wedged around doors and windows, but the dust came in so thinly that it could not be seen in the air and it settled like pollen on the chairs, tables, and dishes. Steinbeck gave a palpable vision of life in the Dust Bowl. Dorothea Lange, a famous photographer of the time, captured with vivid accuracy the experience of living through the Dust Bowl, but perhaps more importantly, she captured the spirit of those who were her subjects and their determination to survive and to thrive despite their conditions. She brought close to home that battle for everyone, regardless of where they lived. The famous singer Woody Guthrie rose to fame during the height of the Dust Bowl. He himself transplant from Oklahoma to California. He never quite forgave those who just labeled him Oki, but he owned the title and he took it from a pejorative to a positive term and spent an entire life producing beautiful music that both entertained and challenged its audience. When the dust finally settled at the end of the droughts, much had changed. But over 250,000 Okies returned to Oklahoma with new sustainable agricultural technologies awaiting them. They were implemented with great success. And those that didn't continue to farm switched to ranching and coal mining 
and other industries that were both profitable and sustainable. It took many years for the economy to recover from the dust bowl. One in five farmers who returned to their home states continued to receive aid from the government for decades after, and real economic recovery wasn't realized until the mid-1950s. After more than a decade of trials and tribulations, Okies had proven themselves a resilient species. They had not only survived these terrible conditions, but they had carved out a new way of life, and they found great pride in the resilience they had shown and their efforts to move forward. Here I will leave you with a clip from the ending of the movie Grapes of Wrath, based on the book by John Steinbeck, where he describes the indelible, persevering nature of an Okie. But we keep a coming. We're the people that live. They can't wipe us out, they can't lick us. We'll go on forever, Pa, because we're the people.